Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from around the world. Welcome to the official launch of Edelman Trust Barometer 2021, Singapore edition. Good to see so many people interested in finding out more about trust that is fundamental to any organization. But before we get started, just a quick overview of today's program. We'll start off with John Kerr, CEO of Edelman Singapore, and Delisha Tan, our Managing Director of Client Growth and Innovation, walking us through the findings of the 21st edition of the Trust Barometer. This will be followed by a panel discussion with Dr. Carol Soon, Senior Research Fellow and Head of Society and Culture Department, Institute of Policy Studies, Merrick Dusik, Deputy Head, Center for Geopolitical and Regional Affairs, member of the Executive Committee, World Economic Forum, who's kindly joined us from Geneva. Um, she, Zikun, Group Executive and Country Head, DBS Singapore, and Zoraida Ibrahim, Deputy Executive Editor, South China Morning Post, who's joining us from Hong Kong. Please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen or scan the QR code that you see on your screen to send us your questions at any time during the session. Now we've got a lot to cover, so let's jump right in. John, over to you. Thank you so much, Marnani. And um, look, thank you so much, everybody, for making the time uh, to attend uh, today's Edelman Trust Barometer launch in Singapore. In today's session, you'll hear many trust themes um, that emerge from the data um, under the umbrella of a global pandemic. You'll hear a lot about inequality, um, racial inequality, systemic, um, especially income inequality. When you have a Dow Jones at 32,000 plus and record unemployment, um, that's not surprising, but the data puts into context how stark the gap can be. Um, we will talk about the fear of job loss, the speed of transformation, and that really um, that the talk of digital transformation is something that we've talked about for a while, both globally and in Singapore, in terms of preparing for the headwinds of change. And, and COVID has really accelerated many of those pieces. And then we'll talk about um, where we are globally. Um, we have put a rallying cry out that there is a need to declare information bankruptcy across all institutions to clear the deck and to build a trust foundation with which to build the next generation of society, of economy, of environment. Um, but most importantly, from a Singapore context and an Asia Pacific context, which I'll touch, touch on as well, um, you'll hear that we have an opportunity. Many of our countries have a trust foundation, but most importantly, our, our study shows that people have aspirations and they have expectations from the future. Um, to really on the reflection of what has been an incredibly tough year for everybody, um, to build a better, a different world built on a foundation of trust. Uh, next slide, please. Just to step back a minute and just to, just to um, make sure we're aligned in terms of the methodology for the survey. Um, we have held Trust Barometer for 21 years um, and currently do uh, the survey in 28 countries across 33,000 people. It's important to note that the time frame of when the study was in the field, mid-October to mid-November. Um, so while we are sharing much of the perspective of the time, um, this is pre any COVID vaccine being clearly and publicly announced as well. In Singapore, um, we spoke to about 1,150 people, um, which we call the general population. Mm -hmm. Of that, 200 of that 1,150 people are what we call informed publics. Best way to think about it, um, college educated, top 25% of household income, and deep engagement in public policy and business, very, very engaged. And then the other 950 people of the 1150 are what we call mass population, representative of the rest of Singapore. Next slide, please. So in reflecting in the 21 years in which we've held the Trust Barometer study, um, if we go back to when Richard Edelman was watching protesters in Seattle trying to storm um, the World Trade Organization meeting and asking the question, what has happened to trust such that people were rallying so strongly against globalization? We've, we've really mapped the shifts and a couple of those are um, through to 2006, um, after looking at globalization and nationalization, we really called um, the importance the emergence and the importance of a person like me as a credible spokesperson. This is very early in the day of social media, but it spoke to the disillusion of trusted authority figures and the movement of what we call the pyramid of authority. We tracked trust through the 2009 financial process and the um, 
the rebuild from that. Um, and then through the middle of the 2010s, we started to realize that with so many sources, so much information, when we declared the battle for the truth in 2018 in response to a fake news epidemic, um, we were really talking about how trust was very much in stasis and under pressure. So when we talk about declaring information bankruptcy globally, um, none of these things happen at silo. It is the outcome of many of these things uh, but speaks to, especially on the back of a global pandemic where people are stressed and people are worried about their safety, the need to make sure that we are teaching good information, hygiene and practice. And so Denisha will talk about that later on. Next slide, please. When we look at the trust index for Singapore and the other markets, on the left-hand side, last year's result from 2020, on the right-hand side, uh, this year's result, the good news for Singapore is that there has been a six point increase in terms of the trust index. Singapore has always been in the trusted category of countries. You will see that there is a dark blue, which means that country is in the trusted category of 60 index and above. Neutral, um, the light blue, and then red under 50 means that there, there is distrust. So Singapore is up six points. I will talk more about where the institutions are but it's really interesting to compare and contrast Singapore with um, the other eight countries of the nine that we hold the trust barometer on in Asia Pacific. And you can see that the highest and most trusted um, or country is India. Um, that is new this year. And you can see for the second country, China, which is down two points, that that is a record year on year decline in China's trust index. More alarmingly, um, we talk about four institutions that we map. They are government, business, NGO, and media. And business trust in China is down 21 points from 91 to 70. And so look, there's been a range of elements around that, potentially corporate scandals such as Black & Coffee, um, around the um, suspension of the IPO of the Ant Group, the antitrust investigation of Alibaba. Uh, but look, uh, one of the things is that we have trust reports for every single one of these countries. And, and if your role looks more across the region or the world, we can share that with you, as well as share links to the trust launches from those countries. I also want to call out Australia, um, a country that I know well. Um, it moved last year from a distrusting zone of 47 massively up 12 points, almost trusted to 59. So again, when you look at what happened in Australia this year, um, the government was up 17 points from 44 trust index to 61. Um, we posit, and we talk to our, our colleagues in Australia, that that is much more about state and local government than necessarily federal government. But business is up 11 points, media up 12 points. And so really what that means is that when you look at the nine markets that we track in terms of trust, that we have six of those nine trusted, um, and then South Korea and Japan is the outliers where we have distrust. And this is important when I talk about the trust foundation that exists. Next slide, please. So another way of looking at where we are in relative trust, now um, Singapore and the four institutions we map versus the global trust index and the four institutions. And you can see globally that business is the most trusted institution um, at 61 points up to, um, and then the others sit in the neutral zone. Um, compare that to Singapore, which has an overall trust index of 68. But what's worth calling out is a couple of important points. One, the 23-point gap in terms of trusted government globally and in Singapore. And so we'll talk more about how the Singapore government has been seen to be trusted over the past 12 months. Also, all four institutions are in the trusted zone and all four institutions are up significantly, six or seven points. We believe that in response to a global pandemic in Singapore, the role of the institutions to be aligned and to work cohesively to address that pandemic has led to much of this trust bump that we see in the past 12 months. Next slide, please. Um, just for interest's sake, um, we have said we have the nine markets in Asia Pacific, um, but just by comparison, if, um, if the, the global number is 56, the Singapore number is 68, APAC trust is on average um, in the middle of the two. But again, in six of the markets that we track, their four institutions are blue as well. Um, across the region, media, the only one sitting in neutral, almost trusted. 
But what that means is that when we talk about a strong trust foundation where all institutions are trusted and all institutions are trusted to do what is right in the face of a global pandemic, that is also representative of six of those nine markets across our region. Next slide, please. Last year, we rolled out this axis. Uh, we have done a huge amount over the past few years to make the trust barometer actionable and also a benchmark and measurable. And, and what we saw clearly through the 21 years of the trust barometer is that there are two key planes in terms of building and managing trust. How competent are you and how ethical? are you seen to be as well. And so with that light blue triangle that you see there, they are the global results and they're kind of boring. They say that the only institution that is seen to be competent is business. Um, and that if you look at government, it is seen as not competent and also not ethical. Now, again, if we compare that in a Singapore context, what this shows you is the light triangle underneath is last year, this year is the dark black triangle. Um, but all institutions sit in the competent and the ethical zones. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the institutions, but I just really want to give you a sense that when we talk about the global context and we talk about declaring information bankruptcy in Singapore and in many of our Asia Pacific markets, the issue is not as stark. Trust is fragile and it can easily move, but we come from the strong trust foundation. And importantly now, we are helping businesses and industries and countries to be able to benchmark and to measure trust. Something that we've done recently with the Association of Banks of Singapore and around putting in place a trust benchmark and score for that industry as it seeks to improve and increase its trust scores going forward. Next slide, please. So as we look at the data, and the data is the most important part, we also, can also contextualize that by looking at the key stories that shaped people's perceptions in 2020. Um, and so really, when you think about everything as touched by COVID, the top two pictures speak to um, the psychology and the discussion online and social media and in chat forums and in news articles um, around where people were as they you know, struggled with lockdown circuit breaker um, and trying to understand how to move to a virtual working environment, for example, from an offline one. So I was in cold storage one Friday night. I'd had Dorscon already signaled, but then I looked up and saw the queue of people and it suddenly realized, I guess much like Richard Edelman at the time, wow, what is going on here? Because there was panic in the supermarket. Um, all the way through to the you know, middle end of the year when, as we moved into phase two on the right hand side, and we really talked about trying to get people to reestablish internal tourism through things like Singapore Rediscovers and the nationalistic pride that many people felt about you know, the way in which Singapore had dealt with a very, very stressful situation and improved safety. Or on the right hand side speaks to um, digitization and, and really the movement towards the gig economy and how business really stepped up. I talked about before how over the past two years, um, the oncoming headwinds is something that we had talked about before. Um, and really um, the COVID pandemic has sped up um, many of those headwinds. Um, and so people have been worried about what is going on in terms of their environment. And then obviously in August, we had an election in Singapore. Um, we find that there is a historical trust bump for government after the election. Um, we also believe that that to be the case as well. We have tracked that across all of the elections in Asia Pacific over the past few years. And then look, there are other moments in time that were zeitgeist and very important and kind of like portraying everyone's experience, whether it was Patsy Diani and how her case gripped the nation and showed how people have voices today, or whether it was the Singapore-based Muslim pro app. There was a whole range of things, but clearly COVID was a key story. Next slide, please. And COVID really affected um, public health and economy, um, putting trust to the test, the budgets that came through to both address and talk about resilience. But I guess really what I want to reflect on here, when I talk to clients and we talk about 
what is happening during the time of COVID. We talk about transformation, but say that not necessarily are things new, but they have sped up to incredible speeds. And so that's what we believe as well, is that pandem the pandemic has put trust to the test as things have sped up, as psychology has moved, and as people's expectations have changed significantly. So let's talk a little bit about that. Next slide, please. Remembering that um, remembering that there are two groups, informed public and mass population, and I talk about inequality being one of the key things that the data shows us at the Trust Barometer this year. From a Singapore context, the informed public, left-hand side, a 76 trust index. On the right-hand side, the mass population, 66, a 10-point trust gap. What that shows is that, and you can see on the left-hand side with all of that blue, that informed public, top 25% of income, highly engaged, highly educated, are much more trusting than those who are outside of that group. This year was a year of record trust inequality in Indonesia, in India, in Malaysia, in the Netherlands and Brazil. But again, I wanna bring you back to Australia, which is sitting at a 55 trust index for mass population, but you can see a 22 point gap between the what the mass population in Australia say in terms of how they feel about trust versus informed public. This trust gap is something we will track very closely going forward. Next slide, please. Remembering that the survey was in the field mid-October to mid-November, um, it meant two things, I think. One of which was there was no well-known vaccine at that point that had been announced, but also having dealt with the pandemic for the previous eight months, um, you know, contracting COVID remains a personal and societal fear, equal for, but our sense is that the general population felt that they were safe and it was under control. So their thoughts start to move to other things that are on their minds. And clearly, as you can see, um, with 90% of people telling us that they are at least concerned and 54% saying they are fearful, um, that there is a worry around job loss and what is going on with my income. And then obviously hackers and cyber attacks um, and then climate change, sustainability. We will talk more about that in a minute. Next slide, please. <laughs> Just to reiterate that point, um, nearly two thirds of people have said that they have seen um, workforce, work hours reduced or jobs eliminate, eliminated, and 62% um, are worried that the pandemic would accelerate um, replacement and automation through things like AI. Again, these are trends that we saw pre-pandemic very strongly, but we believe during the pandemic, some of the foundational pieces that were put in place like the government, like Skills Future, have been even more important in the past year than they were beforehand as well. So job losses, economy, Felicia will talk a little bit about that later on as well. Next slide. This inequality, 65% of people in Singapore believe that those with less education, less money, fewer resources have been unfairly impacted and burdened by pandemic. You can see across the region that that is believed to be true as well. Trust is seen not as a research piece that looks backwards and tells you what's going on, but an indicator of the future. So the next couple of slides are really important. I believe it may be the most important story from the Trust Barometer in Singapore this year about what that future can look like. Next slide, please. When we talk to people about who do you trust, um, really in terms of authoritative voices, um, as you would, wouldn't be surprised with the four institutions overall, um, there is trust in the different types of people in the community. Obviously, that nine point gap in terms of people in the local community, um, we theorize um, that that is a relation to a couple of things. One of which is that while people have been sitting there doing what they believe to be right, following the guidance, you know, there's these stories of people who potentially don't, or they read about all different things, or they speak to people. So this is, could be as much as the human reaction is, I'm doing the right thing. I don't know if I trust the person next door to do the same. Next slide, please. So in closing with my two last two slides, I would get us to look at what does the future look like? If you have a strong trust foundation, we believe it allows the opportunity to pivot post pandemic to a different society, a different economy, a different way of environmental stewardship. So really what this slide says is that in the past year, what has become more important to you? 
Look at the middle column, more important, more than the net change one, improving the healthcare system, obviously. But if you look at the second most important, addressing poverty in this country, if you look at further down, addressing discrimination and racism, including make, making sure we close the economic and social divide at 49 points, there is a huge undercurrent as people sit there and they dwell on their experience and start to look forward to the future about closing these inequality gaps that we've talked about at length. And then climate change and sustainability has become more important to people in Singapore over the past 12 months, which has also reflected many of these groups regionally as well. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the increasing urgency to address these foundational problems, as I said, here's the APAC piece. The only difference between Singapore and APAC is that there are more people who say it's more important, which means there is urgency across the region. Next slide. So let me pass you across to the Shatan to start talking about the declaring information bankruptcy and the infodemic that we must address. Alicia. Thank you, John. One of the key themes that we saw globally this year with the Edelman Trust Barometer is that there is a raging infodemic. So diving a little deeper into that from a Singapore context, next slide, please. We actually do see that despite the fact that Singapore is in a trust bubble, trust still needs to be earned. Uh, what we see is that one in two Singaporeans are, remain skeptical and are concerned that government and business leaders are purposely trying to mislead. We presented this at government briefings earlier this week and last week, um, and there was some discussion that the numbers should be lower for Singapore. So in the context of the election trust bump, we've actually also included the numbers for APEC that actually do show us that, there, um, that our friends across the causeway and across the region are definitely more concerned about government leaders and business leaders and whether we can trust them to share accurate information. If we go on to the next slide, we're looking at credibility of experts and company spokespeople. Um, this year, while we continue to work remote, there has been a significant increase in trust in government officials as well as journalists. Um, with regards to government officials, I think we can also think about the trust bump there. However, um, as more of the journalists are actually in your living room and we're all engaging directly online, we do think that some of the direct engagement has fostered trust in these spokespeople and increased the credibility of a government official, a person like yourself, as well as journalists in the space. If we go on to the next slide and we look at trust in information sources, uh, for us communications professionals, this has always been a slide that we're interested in. And this year, very interestingly for Singapore, we've actually dipped below trusted levels that primarily can be attributed to the fact that a lot more of the um, communications are going direct to the consumer. And there's, it's really a very crowded space with Singaporeans actually not knowing who to trust. Um, what's interesting to note is that from a social media perspective, we have seen a, a plus one change and it still remains um, less trusted than the traditional media or search engines, even though it's eight times more red. So again, um, we see an all time low for traditional media, potentially because um, they may be seen to be breaking news later as a lot of news announcements, especially from the public sector, have now gone direct. If we go on to the next slide, uh, we can take a deeper dive into news organizations, but let's note that this question is not based solely on Singapore media. So what we see is that there is widespread skepticism, which could potentially be driven by opposition's parties move to go direct through social media in their 2020 campaigning, and also some of the backlash that we've seen from uh, online netizens. For instance, there was Sharu Chana on Facebook actually calling out some of um, the commentaries that we've seen in Neha Tapao as well. So again, in terms of news organizations, uh, we've seen a slight dip in trust there. If we move on to one of the highlights of this year's findings, uh, we asked the question about good information hygiene. And we noted that Singaporeans at first glance could be potential super spreaders of this infodemic. How do we define information hygiene? Um, we looked at news engagement, whether you avoid information echo chambers, whether you verify information, and whether or not you amplify unvetted information. Um, we talked about Singapore being in a trust bubble, could potentially be that Singaporeans trust that there are rules that 
with POFMA, for instance, that kind of protect us um, from the uh, fake news or the proliferation of incorrect information. And unfortunately, in Singapore, you know, social cachet is often built on the speed at which you receive or you share information. So this is a very interesting point. And interestingly, when we look at the numbers across the Asia Pacific region as well, we do see that Singaporeans actually perform a little worse. Um, John will dive deeper into that a little later, but it could also be the fact that we have a small media pool and therefore more trusted information sources that people are sharing information from. If we go on to the next slide, um, we also see that information literacy now matters more to the Singaporean. So again, topmost of their priorities, prioritizing my family and their needs, no surprises there. Um, but we also see in the COVID normal, Singaporeans are also interested in increasing their media and information literacy and ensuring that they also understand the science information that is being shared during the COVID pandemic with a nod to the importance of science literacy on that slide as well. Going on to the next section, um, what we're actually seeing is that there's a clear call for business to step up and take charge. And we have seen many organizations actually driving community initiatives and, and really pivoting during the pandemic. If we go to the next slide, um, we've done the study on trust in the employer for the last three years, and we can see that trust remains local. There's no change from last year. And in other markets, there is a greater reliance on the employer as, as an additional credible source of information. Uh, what we see is that across the markets, China has seen the greatest fall, but this is consistent with the decrease in overall trust as well. If we go on to the next slide in terms of most believable sources, um, no surprises there, the employer communications um, comes up second only to public communications in terms of believability. Uh, we may attribute this to greater engagement with the remote workforce. So for a lot of us, the first thing that we log on to every day could be our intranet and could be information from our employers. And we do see that there's a lot higher direct engagement across multiple platforms, which then leads to increased trust in employer media. So heavy burden to carry there uh, for those of us who are also driving the, the internal communications engines. So going on to employee expectations and bearing in mind that this study was fielded um, at the middle of October to the middle of November, as people were returning to work, um, we see that keeping workers and customers safe has been most important in terms of um, the attributes that the employees are actually looking for. Um, what we also see is there's importance uh, of having the option to work from home even when the pandemic is over. And as John mentioned, people are concerned about their jobs, which is why we see that job skill training programs remain important, as well as right down the bottom of that chart, uh, at 52 points, a diverse and representative workforce. So again, if we, if we contrast that or compare that to what we've heard earlier, addressing inequality is actually a big thing to Singaporeans, along with job security as well. If we move on to the next slide, uh, we do see that in terms of returning to the workplace, 71% uh, of Singaporeans actually choose to work from home uh, because of a COVID-19 risk. And in the same way, while we see um, that 29% of Singaporeans are are uh, willing to return to the office or prefer to return the, to the office, the employer keeping the environment safe also remains top of mind. Again, what we're seeing is that um, even though there may be different strokes for different folks um, and really not one size fits all for every employee, um, there, are, there is a willingness for Singaporeans to actually work from home and some of them even citing that this improves their productivity. If we move on to the next slide, what we've also seen is that there are expectations of business to really then step up to the charge and given that people have a sense that they can force change and make a difference, we've seen a lot of community initiatives come to the forefront in the last year. This includes the SG Strong Fund and the Majority Trust as well. If we go on to the next slide, 
Uh, we also see that CEOs are expected to be accountable to the public and the communities within which we operate. We've seen how Tomasek has done this through their foundation and efforts across the board during COVID-19. Um, Maybank, we've seen how they've also added additional traineeships to offer opportunities to those who may be graduating in 20 who may have graduated in 2020 or may be looking for new opportunities. And we even see um, farmers like Boringer Engelheim donating their JSS payouts to um, community and charity groups as well. Um, again, this is not a Singapore only trend. Globally, we see organizations like Unilever, not just donating products that's related to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also offering more than 500 million euros in relief across its extended value chain as well. So again, CEOs are expected to be accountable and we have seen CEOs step up to the task. Moving on to the individual personalities, um, there's also a willingness um, Singaporeans also expect CEOs to speak out publicly on one or more of these societal challenges. No surprises there, pandemic impact. If I can paraphrase uh, DBS's Piyush Gupta, he did also come to the forefront to say that COVID-19 is a chance to do things better. And DBS has also put together their Stronger Together initiative, which has helped ride through the COVID-19 challenges. In addition, we have seen um, Anthony Tan of Grab also committing to upskilling Grab employees in partnerships with organizations like Microsoft. So across the board, we have seen CEOs take the lead on societal issues and the expectations for business are definitely to really come to the forefront and not just look at profit, but also support the communities. John, over to you. So look, in summary, um, in the 21 years that we have done the trust parameter research, we've seen that trust ebbs and flows, goes in waves, and trust can be fragile. Um, we are thankful um, that we already have a strong trust foundation across four institutions in Singapore and on six of the nine markets where we uh, undertake the trust parameter research across the region. Um, but the question is, if I've got this trust foundation and I have the opportunity, but more importantly, the expectation that is high with people about building on that for the next generation of society in terms of economy and also for the environment, what do I need to do? So over the past couple of years, we've talked about the need for business to step up. And the last year has shown, and Valicia's just talked about um, the fact that that has happened. Um, however, more is expected as business is expected to embrace an even more expanded remit that includes leading on issues from sustainability to systemic racism to upskilling employees, let alone showing how um, we and they are contributing to a post-pandemic world. Two and three are connected to that. Um, as many businesses have pivoted towards demonstrating what they are doing to make the community better, to make the jobs are more secure. Um, over the next 12 months, there will be a strong lens to ensure that businesses remain focused and that their position is defendable and accountable over a long period of time. So businesses must continue to lead with facts, to act with empathy, to deliver trustworthy and authentic content, especially into an environment where people still don't know which sources to trust. And finally, again, in the past 12 months, core institutions being trusted means that there is alignment, there is cohesion, and that they are all working together. That must continue and speed up. So look, that is the findings of the um, 2021 Singapore Trust Barometer. Um, and that, you know, now the context around the important themes, I will hand back to Delisha and our esteemed panel. Please keep your questions coming. Um, and thank you, thank you again for taking the time to be at the session and stay safe. Thank you, John. Um, as we've mentioned, we're, we're really pleased to be joined by a very august panel uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have Dr. Carol Soon, the Senior Research Fellow and Head of Society and the Culture Department at the Institute of Policy Studies. Um, Dr. Soon's research interests are in false information, media regulation, digital inclusion, new media ac and activism, online public opinion sensing and public engagement. So I'm sure she'll have lots of insights to share with us today. 
Joining us from Geneva at, uh, this morning for him is Mr. Merit Dusek, the Deputy Head Center for Geopolitical and Regional Affairs and member of the Executive Committee of the World Economic Forum. Um, he brings a wealth of geopolitical understanding and will also give us a sneak peek into some of the discussions that he's been having and what's top of mind for him as well. Uh, we would also like to introduce you to Mr. Shi Zikun, the Group Executive and Country Head of GBS in Singapore. Uh, Zikun is the Country Head and has 27 years of banking experience, starting his career in many uh, senior positions across various front and back office functions, and he's worked in several countries in Asia, the Middle East, and the United Kingdom. And last but definitely not least, we have with us uh, Ms. Zuraida Ibrahim, who is the Deputy Executive Editor of the South China Morning Post. As you know, it's Hong Kong's English language daily, and she leads the city and foreign desk and also runs a Sunday magazine. Uh, Zuraida, a little closer to home, was also previously Deputy Editor of the Straits Times in Singapore and has covered uh, political and foreign beats as well. So thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Great to be here. Thank you. So. Um, lots to, to cover off. Um, maybe I'll start off with um, the triple crises that we're seeing globally, um, which would be the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, the related economic downturn and the urgent need to address issues such as systemic racism, which have combined to upend people's fundamental values, priorities and expectations and profoundly test our trust in societal institutions. Closer to home, what we've seen in Singapore um, has been that we've maintained a strong trust ecosystem, but zooming on the results, we see that top of mind uh, for Singaporeans would really be job loss, cybersecurity, and climate change. Um, in addition to that, 65% of the general population uh, believe that those with less education, less money, and fewer resources may also be unfairly burdened with the most suffering risk of illness and need to sacrifice. So Zikun, looking at business, lots of expectations for you there. Um, do you think that business has stepped up to really address some of these challenges in the last year? And how have you partnered with other institutions, including government, for instance, to be a force for change? Well, thank you. Um, yes, I would say that last year was a really an unprecedented year for many people, right? Uh, and uh, I would say that the businesses generally have really stepped up. Just to give you um, an example, uh, I will speak for the banking industry at large. So at the outset of the pandemic, we knew that uh, there would be certain communities and certain areas of society that will need more help. So with the SMEs, for example, together with government agencies and the MAS, the banking industry came together uh, to avail uh, what we first call, what we call the uh, moratorium for, for the uh, secure lending, right? So any of the property loans, uh, we gave a moratorium, a principal moratorium. We also came together to avail working capital loans um, very quickly. So in DBS alone, for example, I, I, I can't speak for the entire industry, but for DBS alone, uh, we had actually disbursed $4.8 billion worth of loan last year uh, to support the uh, SMEs. And quite a, quite a big amount of that actually went to the micro SMEs. We also helped uh, with individuals uh, who during last year actually had some disruption. So likewise, we worked on certain moratorium for their mortgages. Uh, and at the same time, also helped to restructure some of their, their unsecured loans. We helped businesses digitalize as well so that they can quickly uh, use the pandemic as as actually an opportunity to bounce forward rather than bounce back and access new markets and so on and so forth. So these are areas in which we've actually stepped up in many respects, I would say. Thank you, Zikun. Uh, Mireg, if I could tap on your global experience, um, we see that you know, global business has taken on some of the critical roles to support the community, sometimes ahead of governments in, in some cases. Your thoughts on you know, whether they've come up to the, to the expectations of the public? So absolutely, I think, uh, first of all, I think, again, uh, what, a, what an amazing accomplishment we've seen on the vaccine development over the past uh, few months. If we had this uh, roundtable only half a year ago, um, uh, I think we would think this is a miracle. So I think this is just a uh, testament to, uh, of course, the scientific uh, prowess uh, everywhere in the world, but also then 
uh, how uh, uh, the multi-stakeholder framework, so business, government, and uh, scientific organizations and others can work together at, at rapid speed. Um, we, as you know, at the World Economic Forum, we're based on the multi-stakeholder principle. We believe in public-private cooperation. Um, and uh, you saw also the US Business Roundtable last year now uh, going beyond the shareholder doctrine and saying, okay, the role of business is much larger. It's a huge, uh, there is also this stakeholder responsibility. So absolutely, yes, I think we're seeing that. And there is this um, really good synergy where you see a lot of governments that are of course confronted with the centennial challenge of COVID-19. Uh, and they're responding with visions, with uh, big fiscal stimuli, uh, with other measures. And uh, the business is stepping in, stepping in big time on the how. So it's on the implementation, on figuring out um, uh, how, at which speed, in, in, what, uh, in, in what format we can get to some of these, uh, some of these ambitions, how, keep, how we can realize them. So absolutely. Uh, it's not something that was only spurred by the pandemic. Uh, we've been working with uh, major global companies uh, since the 70s uh, based on the multi-stakeholder principle. But of course, now it's becoming much more mainstream in the uh, context of the COVID-19 challenge. Yeah, and good to see that it's become a lot more local as well. So we're not just seeing big, bold ambitions. If I could move uh, to one of the key headlines of, of this year's Trust Barometer findings, which would be this idea of information bankruptcy and the global infodemic. Uh, what we're seeing is that people in Singapore and globally don't know who to turn to for reliable information. So in fact, less than one in five Singaporeans practice good information hygiene and 60% of respondents have indicated that they share all forward news that they find to be interesting without double checking that. Uh, Zoraida, if I could point to you, how do you think media can play a larger role in supporting better information hygiene? Thank you, Denisha. Um, I can't speak for all media, certainly not the many bad actors who are deliberately spreading disinformation and conspiracy theories and fake science. Um, but I think if you are talking about professional media, we have to go back to fundamentals. We go back to the best available sources of information. And in this case, when we are looking at the pandemic, it's a scientific community. The public health authorities, um, unless they have proven themselves to be unworthy of trust. Um, I think we use all means at our disposal to make sure that reliable, uh, credible information goes out because the public is best served with the best information that is uh, trustworthy. But I do think that looking at your numbers, uh, obviously they're very troubling for the media, uh, not just in Singapore, but I think globally. But I wonder um, whether the problem goes much deeper than simply the availability or lack thereof of a good information. I think the big challenge that institutions are facing is how do you cope in a situation where even when there's good information, a large number of people are impervious to the best information and choose to be misled uh, as your own survey showed. So I think there's something fundamentally dysfunctional about uh, the information ecosystem in today's world. Um, I think we have to grapple with this reality that people are almost um, willfully turning a blind eye to uh, reliable information. Uh, I think your, your survey showed that half of Singaporeans are worried that government leaders are trying to mislead them. I find that uh, quite shocking. Um, and the, the gap with business is only uh, three percentage points, right? 53% uh, for business. So I think, again, we have to ask ourselves, why is this happening? Uh, why would six in 10 people think that professional journalists are trying to mislead them? I don't have the answers, but I think we have to go back to fundamentals. Great. Carol, would you like to weigh in on that? I think your, your field of study covers off uh, a number of areas that Zoraida has discussed. We'll be keen to hear your point of view. Yes, uh, well, thanks. Thanks for all your insights and um, um, great set of findings. So if we talk about uh, uh, the problem with the information deficit, yes, it is a big problem. And your, the, kind, the findings that you have shared today echo some of the work that, uh, some of the results that we found uh, based on studies that we did last year as well. So um, maybe just uh, taking off what Zoraida just mentioned, you know, about trust in um, 
media, traditional media, which I think your survey kind of suggests a, a, a dip, right? Um, I, I think there's a few confluences here. One, a confluence between what people see as traditional media and um, digital forms of traditional media, right? So for example, the perception or association people might instinctively make when they think of traditional media are literally the, perhaps the more traditional forms of productions, right? So perhaps because of that, they think that traditional news could be less timely, um, less updated, that could be one possible influence, right? Uh, but of course, increasingly, we are seeing shifts in people's consumption habits. People are going mobile, they're going digital, and a lot of the sources that they turn to when they're on the go uh, are websites, right? Uh, new sources from legacy media or mainstream media. So um, I, I, I think that the findings could be a little bit different um, if we kind of ask them, um, we kind of, go in depth and ask in a more granular way their media consumption habits um, on whether or not people are willfully turning away from accurate or authoritative information. Yes, there are probably groups of people who are doing that. Um, but I, I think many people, majority are literally just lost, right? In the current info avalanche that we are experiencing. Um, information consumers are hit with a deluge of information sources from everywhere, from um, legacy media, from non-legacy media, uh, their personal social networks. So there is just an overwhelming amount of information. And a lot of this information is noise. So I think we really need to think very hard about helping people to navigate the space. Um, what kind of signposts uh, can we um, introduce to them? So I think your findings also, sh also showed that there is an increase in people's trust in academic experts. I think that is a good sign, um, especially when dealing with a crisis, uh, people are distressed by the negative news that they, um, are, encounter they are exposed to from almost everywhere, every direction that they turn to, right? So, Hence, the I think reliance on mental heuristics, such as a credible or trusted source, would be more important. I think during COVID-19, certainly in the Singapore context, we saw greater visibility of academic experts. Um, that certainly helps. We also see more public communication of science. So these are some of the things we should look at. How do we better signpost authoritative and professional uh, and credible information? Thank you, Carol. Mirek, if I can point to you, um, I know that WEF has been very active in terms of using social media, using your website to share content and information. Um, how do you see, what role do you then see that content playing in the overall uh, news ecosystem? Yeah, I think we're, uh, we're doing that because we feel, of course, uh, the responsibility to uh, share content that is uh, data-based, science-based, that is coming from our different stakeholders. We're quite a holistic organization. As you know, we work with business, as I said, scientific organizations, government, academics. And so we're providing a platform, particularly on our blog, to, to, to people on issues that are important for the global agenda and that uh, we believe are, are based on, uh, based on uh, research and data. So that, that is our contribution overall, but obviously as uh, um, on, on the larger question, it is, uh, we are in a, in a, in a huge transition and uh, uh, we, uh, you may know we've coined the term, uh, the Professor Schwab, our executive chairman, coined the term the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and um, uh, of course, there are many, many developments um, around uh, a lot of technologies and it's so important that uh, we uh, enable individuals wherever they are in the world to be on the front foot when it comes to shaping uh, the use and the, the future of, of those technologies. And uh, that is not trivial. And I just wanted to underscore that we do think that this is of course a transition period, but extremely important uh, as, uh, as Dr. Soon said, to, to, to help uh, through dialogue to find those signposts for individuals and societies around the world to navigate this. Indeed. Zikun, um, one more burden on your shoulders. Employer media actually ranks among 
to the most believable sources of information. And employees have also indicated that regular employee communications has grown more important to them over the past year. How have you at DBS managed your communications and engagement uh, with employees? And have you used um, your employee media to mobilize them during COVID? Or again, do you feel that it's your responsibility to share updated information, for instance, on return to work, for example? Oh yes, absolutely, and 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 I was delighted to 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 read of um of of, of your survey results about how much uh, people trust their employers. So that's very positive for us. Um yeah, so during COVID, uh, what our, what what we had really done right was that uh, we took it upon ourselves, right? We we took it upon ourselves to really uh, show that uh, we care for the employees, right? Uh, that's part and parcel of our DNA, but we recognize even more so. Uh, when 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 the pandemic set in, because uh, suddenly we all had to kind of work remotely. We didn't have the traditional ways by which we could do uh, the physical town halls. We didn't meet each other face to face as it was in the past. So what we did um, at the outset is 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 really just triggered um, the plans, uh, the the pandemic planning that we have done many years for for many years, and and really brought it to play. Um, so what we what we did was there were a few principles that we had always held very true to, um, and, and one one key example um, was that actually by now it's old news, but in the early days we had one very early case of one of our colleagues um, that contracted uh, COVID nineteen, and and we had to actually over manage the whole situation, which involved communicating with our own colleagues because there might be uncertainty fear. Uh, we had to communicate with the public, right? Because we felt that it was also a very clear responsibility we had to the community. So with regard to communication, you know, I, I took charge of it myself because I ran the country, right? And, and there were a few principles where number one, we have to be completely factual, transparent. We have to control the narrative uh, and not allow uh, any inaccurate information to get either to the public or to our own colleagues because that is just going to be unhelpful for anybody. So we got hold of all the facts, be very factual. Uh, we, we had a, a mass communication, which I, I, I drafted and sent personally myself because I, 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 again, wanted to make sure that it came from me, right? So it's, it's, it's gonna be someone credible, came from me. And then we, we cascaded it down through a whole chain that we already had, right? Uh, with um, you know, the people from the premises group, the people from our comms group, the people from our COO groups, which had reached into all the masses in the respective business units and support units because we had a lot of them. And then we had a specific communication for that particular floor from which that colleague came from, right? Uh, and then we also, of course, worked together with uh, MOH and so on, and then to also uh, communicate the media. So the media would hear the factual, absolute factual uh, um, uh, situation from us, right? Um, and then thereafter, what we did was we also uh, we also made sure that we had regular communication and we set the expectations uh, with regular staff advisory. We had two-way communication in which staff could ask questions. We had webinars for them and so on and so forth. So we employ actually many different ways by which uh, we communicated, over-communicated so that we absolutely control the narrative and be completely factual and authentic. Yeah, again, you know, fact, uh, being factual, I, I think, has been key throughout the, the last year across the board, in, no matter what communications we embark on. So, uh, Delisha, I, can I, I just add one point, which I forgot? Yes, Actually, the other thing that we, we, we wanted to make sure was that we also were transparent. It's not just factual, but we were transparent. Most definitely. I, I think that's key to, to employee communications across the board. Um, we've seen how fragile trust can be across institutions. Um, you know, to, to everyone on the panel, how do you think we would be able to maintain this trust in 2021 and beyond? I think specifically, Zoraida, how do you think uh, from a media perspective, you know, we can reclaim some of that trust? Any thoughts? Okay, that's such a big question. Um, I think we have to go back to what we're good at, uh, what, we, what are our strengths, right? I think we are very, very clear about the strengths and value of professionalism, which at its core is all about the discipline of verification, producing news and information that is backed 
by as complete and thorough a process of reporting, verifying, checking, investigating, and checking again. Um, it's great to hear someone like uh, Zerkon from DBS talking about transparency, uh, but that has not always been the experience that we've had on the other side dealing with businesses and governments. Um, but having said that, uh, I think uh, we do bear a big part of the responsibility in uh, trying to get the best information out there. But I think one issue that uh, we have to confront uh, with, whether in, in perhaps less so in Singapore, but definitely uh, this is the case in Hong Kong, where uh, it's a very polarized society where um, they prefer media to simply agree with them or to confirm their own perspective, their own biases. And all we can do, I think, is to hold on to what we know is right, uh, to be as fair and balanced and accurate as possible. Um, and here at the SEMP, uh, we were the first news organization in Asia to join the Trust Project, which is really an information hygiene project, if you think about it. It's about a commitment to steer clear of disinformation and to cover news uh, in an unbi unbiased way and, and really just go back to good old fashioned professional journalism. Of course, this is uh, easier said than done. Thank you, Zoraida. Carol, would you like to build on that? Um, Delicia, your question is, what should we do to kind of sustain or hopefully build trust? Uh, yes. I, I think trust or the lack of trust need not be necessarily a bad thing, right? Because there's a difference when we talk about lack of trust, less trust, there's a difference between skepticism and cynicism. I think in this age of infodemic, some level of skepticism, some level of distrust is actually healthy. What I am more concerned is with a finding that came out from your survey that talked about the increase in trust inequality between two segments, right? Between the informed public and the mass population. And we see quite a big difference in the score, almost a 10 point difference in the score. So my concern is, is this uh, lack of this is the lack of trust um, essentially cynicism and is this cynicism an outcome or possibly a reflection of insecurities and entrenched inequalities could it be due to different segments um, differential ability to engage with various institutions whether it's businesses uh, government the economy or with social life I mean certainly in the work that um, I have done uh, it clearly demonstrates that we should not just look at digital divide in terms of people's access to technology, but also the divide in terms of their ability right, to fully use and harness technology to advance themselves, whether it's socially um, or economically. So moving forward, other than thinking about how to sustain and build trust, we really need to think about how to overcome cynicism, and more importantly, structural inequities among so within society. Thank you, Carol. And, and I think our, our research points to the fact that Singaporeans are definitely concerned about how we address this inequality across the board as well. Uh, Mirek, I, I'd like to, to point back to you. I think um, the WEF has been championing stakeholder uh, uh, has been championing the need for organizations and companies to seek long-term value, uh, value creation, taking into account the needs of the communities and society at large. So building on, on what Carol was saying, uh, really looking at the community and society, will this be a, a key feature of your discussions that will take place here in Singapore in August? Yeah, we're very excited to be uh, in Singapore in August. Um, um, we, as you know, uh, or may know, we held our digital Davos um, uh, in January, and uh, the theme was a crucial year to rebuild trust. So trust was really very much on the agenda. We had over 25 heads of state and government, and of course, business leaders, um, and heads of state and government from all corners of the world, major powers that uh, not always agree on all things, but they agree they came to talk about how can we rebuild uh, trust. So my point first, I'd like to say that of course, um, we can talk about how governments can rebuild trust, how businesses can rebuild or build more trust and others. 
but there is also the tissue in between them. Uh, and uh, uh, we need to recognize that uh, even before the pandemic, the collaborative tissue of the international community was under stress. As we all know, it was quite uh, hurt or, or, or uh, affected negatively already by the financial crisis. It has never really recovered fully. And the uh, other uh, widely acknowledged thing, of course, is that globalization had been under stress in terms of how it delivers within societies. Um, in Asia, maybe less so, uh, but in many corners uh, of the world, uh, it has become a big issue in terms of how we can make sure that we rebal rebalance globalization in a way that is more equitable and we close some of these uh, inequities that have been springing up in, in many uh, societies. So if we are gonna be focusing on a few things when we come to Singapore in August, it's uh, definitely gonna be these uh, societal uh, and economic uh, inequalities and how do we make sure that in frankly a more competitive international environment, how can we uh, uh, renew the collaborative tissue uh, to the extent that we do have the trade regimes, the FDI regimes, the uh, digital trade regimes, hugely important to, to fix, uh, to, to figure out digital trade, uh, data flow regimes, etc. How do we make sure that those are done in a way that uh, uh, the people that are maybe left behind in certain societies feel that is actually good for them as well? So uh, obviously this is top of mind for political leaders, um, you know, the Prime Minister of Singapore uh, uh, honored us with his speech uh, at the Davos Agenda Week, the Digital Davos last uh, month. I listened to the speech yesterday again, and he talked about the balance that politicians everywhere need to strike between the domestic expectations on, on the one hand uh, and to really meet the expectations of the population. Uh, and then of course, the need to really be open and collaborative. And I think that's gonna be the main uh, like motive, if you will, of when we meet in August. But obviously, the uh, just to complete the picture, we will be focusing also on the two big, two other big axes of today's world, which is the sustainability imperative and the digital transition imperative. Thank you so much, Mireille, and thank you for that curtain raiser on, on what's going to be discussed here in August as well. Ziku, last but definitely not least, um, I understand that our, our data and intelligence team has done some work uh, with you and, and the banking sector to really understand trust in banks and, and drivers of this trust. And as Mirek talked about earlier, trust is definitely top of mind for businesses. Uh, why is this crucial for the sector and your specific business? Well, I guess if, 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 if what Mirek has said, uh, that trust is crucial for business, I'll say it's probably even more crucial for banking. Uh, because uh, banking, I would say, is really, really fundamentally built on trust being a key foundation. Uh, it is it, in the banks that people actually entrust uh, their money and trust a lot of their information too. And so we really have that uh, very, very clear fundamental duty, right, uh, to do well. Um, and when, 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 when there is a lack in trust uh, in the banking sector or in the banking industry, I think that in itself will have very, very negative uh, implications on the economy because the fundamentals of banking is necessary to facilitate um, the smooth running of any economy and also the development of any economy because we facilitate transactions, we facilitate the capital flow for development. Um, and that is being fundamental, that is fundamental to banking. And Singapore, as we know, is a financial center, financial hub. And so banking is really, or banks form the key industry in, in, in Singapore. So when the Association of Banks came together, you know, self-directed, working hand in hand with our regulator MAS um, to set up this uh, culture and conduct group, right? Uh, which they asked me to chair, I was delighted. And one of the things we first did was to really uh, launch this uh, banking trust index for Singapore. Uh, and why we wanted to do it was because we really wanted to take this very, very seriously. I mean, this in itself, the very fact that we did it upon ourselves, we wanted to really know, hopefully would also be an indicator that we want to earn your trust. We don't want to take your trust for granted. Uh, we don't want to be complacent. So we truly want to know where we stack up 
so that we have a benchmark from which year on year on year, we will be able to, to know uh, whether we have improved or we have um, not done as well. And also in these surveys, we will know exactly the verbatims and what people are saying, which aspects we as an industry and we individual banks within an industry have to work on because we want to continue to build on the trust. And, and what I would say we were quite delighted is that in the, it, about is that in this very first survey, it does show uh, very uh, much aligned to what you all are talking about today about Singapore, that banks in Singapore actually are very, very trusted uh, by the public, which is a good starting point. But we don't want to take this for granted. And that's why, as I said, we've done this as a benchmark so we can continue to build on it from here. Most definitely. Thank you, Zikun. I'll now uh, move into the Q&A section uh, of today's um, launch event. Uh, there is um, a question that here from, from the floor, what do you think is needed to maintain the high on the Singapore Trust Index? So again, what can we do to maintain this trust bubble? Uh, John, if you're able to take the first pass and then I'll point to the panelists. So in terms of the trust foundation, I'll call it as opposed to a trust bubble, um, the, you know, the importance of keeping it going is that uh, we are, you know, we throw these, these terms around, <clears throat> fourth industrial revolution, kind of digital transformation, um, but there is no doubt that the world post-pandemic um, will be different to the world pre-pandemic. And so therefore making sure that um, people feel as though as they step forward into what will be a complex, confusing, you know, in many ways, uncertain world, that there is trust in the institutions that they expect to do the right things um, from, as I said, a societal perspective, an economic perspective, an environmental stewardship perspective remains absolutely crucial. Because otherwise, what you end up with is misalignment and lack of cohesion. That means that, um, that really it's hard to get things moving and to be able to realize this opportunity that exists for the Trust Foundation. So it, it's, it's, it's much like Ziku talked about. Um, it is about ensuring that people can trust the communications that are coming from these institutions, that they are defendable, they are authentic. Um, more, more importantly than ever, they are empathetic um, and they are honest and they are personal, much like the story of writing the communication to the employees directly. So look, I think that's why it's important. Um, and I think, again, those elements remain even more important, in fact, accelerated going forward to get to the society we all covered. Yeah, uh, Zikun, I, I saw you nodding. Anything to build on, on John's comment there? Yes, I, I, know, I, I would like to say, you know, if we want to continue to build on trust, we must first be very clear and, under, and, and understand what actually built that trust. What is that trust built on? And also uh, the lack of trust often is when people start to take certain sides, right? Um, uh, one And then start being played one against another. And that's where I think trust breaks down. So I think, interestingly, I did feel that during the pandemic last year, actually the, the entire nation came together in Singapore. And I, I, I think that, that was really very powerful and very, very touching. Right? The entire nation came together because we really stuck ourselves out one for another. Uh, we stepped up one for another, whether it was the frontliners um, in the medical sector or businesses, as you say, the banks stepped up and helped businesses, helped individuals. Communities started to help the wider communities, those who had helped those who needed. And, and, I, I, and then the government, of course, stepped up big time as well. So I felt last year, the entire nation all over came together. And I think for us to continue to build on that, right? Uh, to build on this trust, we must not allow that to be, to be rocked. Uh, and, and, and if there is a common purpose, if we do not forget our common purpose, and all we, we work towards that. Sometimes some people have to give and some people take, other times you take and someone gives. I think that entire understanding of that common purpose, uh, that common um, need to survive and grow together. I think that is, that is really, really important. Over and above all those other things right, which I talk about transparency in communication. And uh, to me, that comes secondary. That's the execution of it. Right, but the fundamental core, I think, is what we need to protect. Thank you, Zikun. Zurada, would you like to build on that? There's also a sub question um, on how we think we can help traditional media bounce back from uh, record low trust levels. So, again, your right. thoughts on that? 
Thank you. Um, I think I am going to disagree slightly with the other panelists. Uh, I know the top line figures look very uh, attractive for Singapore. They're very reassuring, uh, especially when we compare ourselves to other societies in APEC. I think we've come out at the other end of the tunnel uh, quite well. But I think the devil is in the details. And again, I cite uh, a couple of figures. I think when 53 50% of the people think that the government is out to mislead them, I think that should give cause for pause. I think when uh, uh, more than, I think 90% of the people feel worried about uh, jobs at a time when the government has been pouring in enormous amounts of money for the job support scheme. Again, you have to wonder what's going on. Uh, where is this um, lack of confidence or where is this anxiety coming from? Uh, no doubt, I think uh, this idea of Singaporeans coming together at a time of crisis, I'm sure there was a lot of that, but I think um, we cannot afford to uh, just look at the bright side. I think we do have to look at these other more troubling numbers and ask ourselves uh, whether there are something more um, to, these to these data points. Uh, and on traditional media for the first time in Singapore, dipping below the 50% uh, point, um, I think this is, has been part of the secular decline. Uh, it's reflective of what's been going on globally. Um, again, you know, I, I don't work for Singapore media and I, I, I wouldn't be so bold as to speak on their behalf. But um, I think they have to ask themselves whether uh, we are serving the public in ways that they want to be served. Uh, where are the areas in which uh, they are asking for information, they are asking for insight and uh, we, they are not delivering. Uh, I think maybe it's a uh, time for uh, reflection. Um, but again, um, uh, I, this is a bit nuanced. I think to place the burden entirely on the media is also unfair. As I said earlier, I think there is something fundamental uh, going on here. Something structural is happening, not just in Singapore, globally where there is the rise of cynicism that's built on, maybe the social compact needs to be uh, readdressed. Uh, we need to relook post pandemic, uh, what are the inequities that we have to pay greater attention to? Thank you. Thank you, Zoretta. And I, I think it's very clear from the data that there are clear areas where we could do better, really in terms of digging deep, um, supporting different communities and also then reacting and evolving society in certain ways. I think that's very clear. Carol, would you like to build on that? Your thoughts, please. So trust really requires a well, ecosystem approach. So Zuraida talked about uh, perhaps a reflection of um, the growth globally, not just in Singapore, distrust or cynicism. And I believe, uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, in the survey questions that you pose to uh, respondents pertaining to their trust in various institutions. So when it came to traditional media, social media, the questions are not directly targeted at say Singaporean media, right? Singaporean traditional media, etc. Uh, let's not forget, uh, Singaporeans are also reading um, news from other sources and they are exposed to the very complex and in some cases, disturbing dynamics that we are seeing um, in media landscapes in other countries, right? Where clearly uh, the media landscape reflects the polarities in the political landscape, uh, taking very biased, um, extreme ends simply because of the desire or the impetus to support a specific ideology. So that is a contribution to, to that is a possible factor that explains why people's decline in traditional media has fallen. So we need to think about not just what's happening in Singapore, but what's happening globally as well. NGOs, I thought was interesting because when we talk about non-governmental organizations, for people who do work in the field, we tend to associate them with you know, very formalized structures. But I'm also thinking as I went through your stack, your rich stack of findings, would, are people also thinking of the more informal ground up kind 
of community organization. And we see a fair bit of that during COVID-19, where people took into their own hands, um, invested their own time, their resources, no matter how much or how little they had, uh, to try to solve different problems that, that was associated with the pandemic, right? Whether it was the distribution of masks and hand sanitizers, or even the spreading of correct information and the debunking of false information. We saw a wide array of efforts. Uh, moving forward, I what the current government is trying to do, which is to foster more 3P partnerships, that could be a good move. Right. So that, again, builds on an ecosystem approach because you cannot just um, pin the responsibility on one specific institution, whether it's the media or the government, to increase the trust score. Really, we need to look at what different institutions can do, including citizens, them citizens themselves. Indeed. I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, this question is on information sources. So how do you square trust in information sources nearing record lows, in particular traditional media, declining 8 percentage points, with the 7 percentage point increase in trust in media as an institution? Um, Carol, can I point that to you? So again, decline in trust in, in media as an information source, but again, increased trust in media as an institution. Actually, maybe, maybe I'll jump in on that, Dal, if that's Go okay. ahead, John. <laughs> Only because yeah. that's probably more a technical piece of the data. But, but really, the, 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 question, the fundamental trust question is how much do you trust person, institution to do what is right? And I think that, you know, you could look at it and you can see the inconsistencies. But um, when you ask about an individual versus an, in, like an organization, so, you know, people are saying journalists are very trustworthy. But then when they talk about an information source that they make decisions based upon, it's easier to say, no, I don't trust it. In the same way, you could say that people are like, you know, how much do you trust the government to do what's right? What is right? I do trust it. Back to Zoraida's piece, no, um, point, nothing is guaranteed because there's an inbuilt cynicism. So when you're asked kind of like, do you feel as though the government's telling the truth? Maybe not, right? Um, but in terms of people versus sources, a face versus a faceless, um, I think that's one of the reasons why the data skews. So um, anyway, there's probably more context from Carol. Thank you, John. Carol, anything to add there? No, I think that's a perfect explanation. <laughs> uh, I have nothing further to add. Thank you. Okay, no worries. Okay. Um, Mirek, uh, if I, I can point to you, we don't have any additional questions at this time, but while we wait for the next question, uh, Mirek, what, what we see and, and hear from the WEF is that business leadership will be crucial to long-term recovery from the pandemic. Um, what do you see uh, as potential new approaches that will be needed to engage companies with governments and local communities to really rebuild um, economies to make our society a, a more resilient one moving forward? Uh, it's a crucial, uh, crucial area. Um, I should also add that, uh, of course, businesses are stepping up uh, to this, uh, uh, most of them, I think. Uh, but uh, it's also, I think the pandemic is uh, uh, providing a test to companies in terms of how uh, stakeholder minded they actually are. So I think if we look at the companies that are really um, weathering the crisis well, they do have the trust of uh, their employees, they have the trust of their partners, of their suppliers, their clients, uh, and that is the stakeholder principle. Um, and uh, we have been always talking about that, and uh, it is not only about uh, uh, delivering profit to shareholders. Um, obviously, we have now, uh, again, in the mainstream, the ESG metrics, so it's, um, it's important to measure things uh, uh, that we talk about, so we need, to, we need to measure to see the deeds, and so as you know, the, uh, the ESG metrics are again becoming mainstream, not only in the financial and investment industry, but they're going further, and also more and more things are being added to those metrics, so the winds are changing in terms of the role of business, clearly. And the businesses, I think, are all thinking hard about how to be on the right side of history on that. Uh, now on the how, uh, there are a myriad of ways. Um, um, I work a lot on Europe, so I can tell you that uh, there is a lot of uh, 
energy now around uh, figuring out how to realize the European Green Deal, which is a, a major uh, a major ambition by the European Commission. Uh, again, it's the vision, but uh, actually the nitty gritty of how, for example, how do you actually decarbonize the food system is not a trivial thing because you have things that are um, around the farming subsidies. There are certain things uh, that you need to take care of uh, on the kind of societal level. Uh, there are certain uh, supply chains and value chains. And so companies uh, are stepping up. Uh, we have a coalition, we call them lighthouses. So it's a lighthouse around how you guide private public cooperation on decarbonizing the food system in Europe, for example. But I could, I could mention many more. Uh, these public-private partnerships take many forms. As you said, it's important that they have, uh, even if they are globally distributed, they need to have local impact. Uh, and um, maybe one last thing is so important now to pay attention to uh, frontier and emerging markets because we know that, uh, that um, yes, we are all hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, also economically, but some countries have more fiscal space. I mentioned the stimuli but many countries don't have the fiscal space. So we're uh, expecting that emerging and frontier markets are gonna be hit harder. And so there, this kind of stepping up of business that is invested in those economies as, a, uh, as, as, as the embodiment of stakeholder capitalism is even doubly important. Thank you, Mirai. And we have one last question from the floor. Um, only 18% of Singaporeans have good information hygiene compared to the global figure of 26%. And 46% of Singaporeans have poor hygiene while the poor information hygiene while the global figure stands at 39%. What does this say about Singapore's push to become a smart nation? John, would you like to take that first? And then I'd like to point to Carol and Zoraida as well. Uh, very quickly, um, what I'd say is that Singapore, um, and again, Carol touched on the fact there's, there's more media than just local media, but if you see local media, you trust it to be factual and correct, and maybe you share it without validating it. So again, uh, maybe that part was one of the reasons why Singapore is so, because that is not verification. Any points to add there, Carol? Yes. Um, the figures don't look good, that's for sure. And uh, an instinctive reaction would be uh, what's happening is uh, what's with the perceived lack of progress, you know, given that we have been doing a lot in the past years to uh, in, improve people's digital literacy, etc. Uh, if you look at the efforts to advance Singapore into an e-society, to move Singaporeans into e-government, etc., they didn't just start the five, five years ago or 10 years ago, right? They started well, in the 1990s with your IT master plan and your Infocom 21. So a lot of what has been done since, but I think when it comes to um, tech, uh, digital competencies, digital literacy, unfortunately, there will be no end to upgrading and making progress. With regards to Zoraida's point on the growing pool of cynics, does Edelman have any insights on what is causing that trust deficit amongst them? Any consistent pain points over the year? Over the years, John. Just quickly, I'd love other perspectives, but I think I trust that before. There is an undercurrent and fear about the future. And so, you know, like when I talked about that question about the next five years and 50% of Singaporeans were saying they were unsure or did not believe that the future would be better for them, um, that, that, you know, it speaks to where I started with. Trust is a very fragile thing. Um, to Zoraida's point, we cannot believe just because there is a trust foundation there that that continues onwards. And it could take a seismic announcement about jobs or about things like cybersecurity change that trust dynamically because underneath it all, um, back to the social compact piece, people remain unsure, they are concerned, um, but they need to still move forward. So having a trust foundation allows the opportunity to make that happen. Thank you. We'll take any last comments from, from the panel. Uh, thank you so much for your questions. There's also another question about um, what can brands and marketers learn from the Edelman Trust Barometer? We'll come back to you on that one. But panel, any last thoughts? Zikun, I, I see you're unmuted. Any thoughts from you? 
I, I, I guess I just wanted to build on the, the, the last question and, and what Zuraida mentioned earlier on. Uh, when Zuraida said um, that she might be disagreeing with the panelists, I, I would say, Zuraida, I don't think you were. Um, so I, I did say that, um, that last year when we saw the nation coming together, that was really a, a very good, touching and positive thing, which actually is some light at the end of the tunnel. So while there might be so-called incre increasing cynicism, what we can say is that actually, if we kind of pull together, we can actually still build on, build on the trust. So just be very clear what the underlying purpose is. And I like the point that John made earlier on about the undercurrents. So we can never be complacent. If we, want, if we want to continue this, we cannot be complacent. We must work on the undercurrents and some of which are the inequalities and all that that we all were talking about just now already, which is um, actually what we have seen in the world. Um, and... Uh, perhaps increasing in Singapore, although perhaps not in that, 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 that level of magnitude. So we need to be very conscious of these things. Uh, but I, I would like to maybe disagree a little bit with Zuraida. <laughs> that that, that I, I think some of this cynicism might not necessarily be that there's no trust or low trust in the government and so on and so forth. But it might be that there are many other parts about the environment, which is what is quite beyond anybody. So, so, so all in all, um, I think you know, we still have a good foundation. We cannot be complacent. Uh, let's work on the undercurrents and do it together. Thank Just you. a quick one, and more specifically to, related to the information hygiene. Um, I, I'm just looking at your findings on priorities, priorities shift. And I think it's encouraging, and I would like to kind of end us off on a good note, right? And it's... People think that it's more important to increase their media and information literacy. They also think that it's more important to increase their science literacy. So there is a desire, there is a hunger. So what can we do moving forward? Um, not just media, not just government or NGO, but what can we all do, right? To uh, encourage healthy skepticism, uh, but yet, you know, uh, avoid cynicism. Thank you. All right, looks like we've come to the end of the session. Um, thank you so much, panel, uh, for such an insightful discussion. Zerada joining us from Hong Kong, Mirik uh, over in Geneva, and Carol and Sikuna a little closer to home as well. Um, we'd like to thank you once again for joining us at the launch of the Edelman Trust Barometer Singapore. And please do feel free to reach out to myself or any of the Edelman team if you would like to take a dive deeper into the information or need anything else at all. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a great afternoon.